Welcome to the Bonhoeffer Project Podcast. My name is Dan Lights. I'm with my co-host, Stephen Kimbrell. Hey, guys. There he is. I, I don't, just wondering if I should call you doctor again because we said it the last time. But <laughs> are we going to keep that rumor going? I'm just you not know, sure. If you say something enough times, it becomes it just reality. Becomes, right? Yeah, it becomes so let's true. let's just keep saying it. Uh, Stephen, why don't you take a second to introduce our guest today? Absolutely. I'd love to. We're, we're really excited about our guest today. His name's Craig Etheridge. He pastors in Dallas, Texas at the Cross Creek Church. He's also the founder and president of Disciple First Ministries. And we get to talk to him about a book that he wrote recently Absolutely. called The Disciple-Making Leader. And so, Craig, we're excited to have you. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, guys. Great to see you. And, uh, man, thanks for having me on. Yeah. And Craig's coming to us from the great state of Texas, Texas. Um, sometimes referred to as the great nation of Texas. Yeah. I just tell Amen. all the people that have left California, we say Hi. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's a I will, thing. I got several of them in my church. Let yeah. me tell you. <laughs> I was gonna say because it's just a Probably thing. Some of our church. I, no, church I'm time, telling right? you. Yeah. Like whenever I've gone across uh, different states and things like that, mm -hmm. I've met former members of my church. I'm like, yeah. hey, good to see you. Yeah, I'll send you a thank you note. Yeah, I appreciate uh, that. <laughs> we are populating the rest of America. That's it. That's it. We're salt of the earth. We're sprinkling it go. everywhere. Here we, we are. Sprinkle it out, baby. <laughs> Well, so, yeah, go ahead, Craig. We're we're glad to have you, and thank you for making time. And we know that you're a uh, you're a guy that disciple making has been a passion of yours for a long time. But you know, we, I love to hear people's story of just you know how that got started with you because I don't think that's always a, a natural thing sure. uh, for people uh, or not an instantaneous thing Definitely at least. Not. So when did that start for you? Tell us a little bit of that story. Yeah, just kind of the quick version. Um, you know, I, I feel like that most of my journey began when I was in seminary. Uh, I was in seminary working at a church, working with college students. And uh, there was this one guy who was at Baylor University, which is, you know, about about an hour and a half from us. And uh, this guy used to be an Olympic wrestler. He had a barrel chest. Mm. He had thighs like tree trunks. He had this big, massive beard, just vice grip, you know, arms. And he was leading a lot of football players to Christ, and he had this booming ministry. And so I was interacting with him because I was kind of in the college ministry at the time. And I noticed that everywhere he went, we, he had some guy with him mm -hmm. you know, that he was discipling and investing in. And uh, so that caught my attention. And he wrote this small little discipleship piece. And so I took that, and I decided to do my first discipleship group. So I had... I did it all wrong, man. I had too many in the group. I had guys and girls yeah, in the group. Yeah. We're all packed in. I, mean, I, I broke every rule, you know, that there is. Yeah. And yet God used that. Mm -hmm. You know, so many of those, uh, some of those are leaders in, in my church still today. Wow. Uh, we're in that very first discipleship group. And many are, are pastors and in leadership around the world. But yeah. uh, God really used that to spark in me this desire to invest in others that would multiply mm -hmm. into a movement. And of course that that's really the beginning of it. Sure. You know, meeting Bill, you know, I met Bill Hull when I was uh, doing my doctoral work in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first time I had a class under him right after mm -hmm. he'd written that this, Jesus Christ disciple maker, mm -hmm. disciple maker. And uh, man, that, that book lit, lit me up. And yeah. then uh, Dan Spader and then other guys that yeah. kind of yeah. came into my life that every one of them seemed to just unfold another mm -hmm. layer of what it looked like um, to to be a, a disciple of Jesus mm -hmm. and what does it look like to make disciples and then to lead a disciple making ministry mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just I'm just grateful for every one of them. Yeah, that's great. That's, I I love that. I know we got a lot of stuff yeah, to talk about, but I good. love that first story of like I. I just went and I, I put a group together and we started trying to make disciples and I butchered it in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. but some of those disciples are still around today. I, I think that, I feel like that's the hardest hurdle for a lot of people to get over. Yeah. It's just sure. getting started. Yeah. Right. Right. Like well, just, we've talked about just doing something. I think a lot of it is too, just being okay to make mistakes. Yeah. I think so many people are just so afraid that they're going to do it wrong. Yeah, that the, it just cripples them. Cripples get the them process perfect before you ever start it, right? Right. <laughs> like if we can just get yeah, the absolutely. perfect system. 
And you know, you just uh, you just got to get started. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, that's what I tell pastors all the time. Mm-hmm. Hey, you're not going to mess them up any worse than they already are. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so just uh, you know, great. I mean, really, let's let's just be honest. You know, yeah. so just just get in there yeah. and pick a tool and go to work. Mm-hmm. And it, it's really, you know, the pressure is off, guys, because mm-hmm. it's really only the Holy Spirit that can mature a person, that mm-hmm. can grow a person. You know, God just chooses to use us because He's kind in doing it. Mm-hmm. But um, I think we feel like so much is on us when really God's going to do the work. And I can't tell you how many times I did. I led a group and I thought that was a bust, <laughs> and then and God just brought a lot of fruit. You know, yeah. and then and and the opposite too. Sometimes I think I rocked it on that, and, oh, yeah. and it turned out to be nothing. So it just reminds us that we may plant, others may water, but God is the one yeah. that causes the growth. Amen. So give me the, I mean, being in the disciple making, uh, world, there's, there's something that's, that's intriguing to me. And, and what that is, is, you know, every 10 years or so, maybe seven years, there's, there's kind of a, a paradigm shift within the Christian world. There's, you know, there's a season of man, everything, you know, church planting is all the rage, uh, missions. It's all the rage. Um, Mm -hmm. being emergent (laughs) again, there's just different seasons. I kiss dating goodbye, right? (laughs) Dating the rage. It seems to me, and I've talked to other disciple making leaders on this, that disciple making is in, in vogue right now. It's in fashion. How do, and again, whether you see that or not, how do we keep it from going out of fashion? Like how do we uh, land on making this kind of uh, moment where, where it seems to be in the forefront of people's minds, how do we keep it going so that people don't lose it or think that it's a, a fad? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a really good, great question. And I, and I don't disagree that it's certainly more popular now than it was 20 years ago. I right. mean, when I had that first group, nobody was talking no. about, there were mm-hmm. no disciple making. I mean, Bill, you know, had just written a book, but mm-hmm. he was a little bit of a voice in the wilderness, so to speak. Yeah. He and Dan and some of those guys, uh, but it wasn't uh, kind of in the vernacular mm-hmm. of, of most ministries and certainly not in the vernacular of pastors. I mean, yeah. I never sat under a disciple making pastor. I never heard a pastor, never saw him discipling anybody, challenging anybody to multiply. So and and quite honestly, it's still a pretty small circle sure. uh, of pastors that have that. So I think, you know, I think you ride the wave that's there, you know, right. if there's some. If there's some interest, then we speak into it. But the fact is that the the interest of people come and go. Yeah. But we we know that disciple making isn't a fad because That's Jesus right. started it mm. back you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. in his ministry, yeah, right? So it's absolutely. rooted in history. And what what's cool is you can go back and look through church history, whether you're looking at St. Patrick and the movement that happened in Ireland, or you fast forward to the Great Awakening through John Wesley and his movement. All of them follow the same disciple making pattern. Yeah. And even right now, there's a lot of discussion about revival and awakening, right. what's happening in Asbury and you know, in, yep. in campuses in the country. But if you go back and look at true great awakenings, there was a sense of repentance and, and spiritual awakening followed by disciple making and developing, mm. and that all then produced church planting. Yeah. And that is the consistent pattern throughout church history. Amen. So whether the whether the interest comes and go, we just have to be consistently uh, communicating the same message and consistently doing it, not just talking about it, mm. but actually in the game doing it. Amen. That's good. So we mentioned your book, uh, The Disciple Making Leader. Um, could you maybe take a moment and just share with us a little bit of uh, maybe an overview of what that book's about, and then we can dive into it a little bit? Yeah, sure. So the uh, the book basically is an attempt to talk about uh, this unique kind of leader called a disciple-making leader mm. and trying to identify that as a kind of leadership. Um, I, in our churches, our churches are filled with people that are running programs, and 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 many times we are we are um, attracted to the superstar, right? Yeah, the superstar communicator, the superstar worship leader, the the gifted communicator, the gifted leader, the gifted uh, person that can draw a crowd. Uh, but the problem is that that person 
um, does not reproduce themselves. That person mm-hmm. doesn't reproduce people underneath them. Mm-hmm. So they are kind of what uh, Jim Collins called the genius with a thousand helpers. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are the ones that everybody's attracted to and wowed by. But when they leave, yeah. the church now stalemated because they they everything is dependent on the superstar. Yeah. Uh, you you know you see this in basketball. You got to have two or three superstars mm-hmm. if you're going to make, make it you know, to the finals or whatever the case may be. And churches have that same mentality. But I'm arguing in the book that we don't necessarily need superstars. What we need are disciple-making leaders. Mm. And these are leaders that walk with God, leaders that reproduce their life, and that when they leave, they leave behind them a cadre of mm. of themselves. They mm-hmm. they multiply themselves in such a way that it builds up the church and multiplies the church. And that's what we're missing uh, on our church staffs and and in our church leadership, and that's that's really what the book is about. How did Jesus develop leaders like that? Mm. You know that that kind of brings to light. You know, obviously, you're having to uh, talk about this and write a book about it because our culture is so inundated with a, a celebrity mindset, right? Mm. That we're always, like you said, looking for. Um, that guy and 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 the church world's no different. I mean, yeah. celebrity pastors and celebrity leaders, and like you said, the genius with the thousand helpers. How do we? Because again, I, I would say the enemy's so nefarious that he could find a disciple making leader and elevate him too. And and you know, next thing you know, it's the very thing that we don't want to have happen is now happening, and the very thing that we don't want it to have happen. Mm. Sorry, that's yeah. just a lot of where my head's at. But how do we? keep that from happening? How do we, again, uh, again, speaking to this culture, just do the hard work on the back end and, and not get wooed by that? Yeah, I, I think um, that certainly is in the air, right? Mm-hmm. It's in the water that celebrity being a superstar producing results, and that will elevate you up mm-hmm. to the next biggest church and the next biggest church mm-hmm. or where the case may be. But I, but what we're really we we've seen where that can take us, right? Sure. We we I think that we've run that course. <laughs> we've seen what that celebrity kind of leadership will take you. And right now, the, our country's not getting more godly. Right. We're becoming more disinterested. We're and of course those leaders when they fall, they bring a broad base of discrediting the gospel with them. And so what we we don't need one superstar. We need a hundred yeah. uh, mm-hmm. people out there multiplying themselves, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. And so, uh, but but as a as a church pastor, I'm guilty of it too, man. I want the superstar uh, worship guy. I yeah, want yeah. the superstar youth. Guy. I want the kids guy that's going to attract young families. And so the issue is, okay, how do we how do we produce people, yeah. and how do we move them down the spiritual growth pathway, and then elevate them into leadership once they are mature and mm. once they know how to multiply themselves? And that's been the big key. And so that's kind of really what the book is talking about is um, it, it, I, I really talk about this this grid, this X, Y axis. Mm-hmm. And uh, the horizontal axis is really about a spiritual growth pathway. You have to have a very clear pathway of how someone grows spiritually. And I kind of unpack in the book, what was Jesus's pathway? And I look at the four steps. Again, these are not unfamiliar mm. uh, to you guys because... 25 years ago, when Bill wrote the disciple making, right. uh, Jesus Christ disciple maker, he talked about come and see, follow yep. me, be with me. Remember yep. that? Yep. So that really that he he was even then 25 years ago unpacking a spiritual growth pathway that Jesus modeled that we can model to in our own churches. Yeah, so I, I talk about the pathway and what does that look like, and I kind of unpack that. Uh, but then and then I add to that this vertical axis which is about a leadership pipeline. Mm. And then we put these two together. And, and I talk about the five layers of a leadership pipeline. And of course, leadership pipelines a, a, is a popular phrase right now. Mm, right. Uh, book leadership pipeline really came out in the 2000s. Uh, it was popular in businesses, but churches uh, are just now kind of catching on sure. to value of raising up leaders within mm-hmm. a pipeline in our church. And uh, and so I, I put these two together, and I and, and I can't really draw this, you know, 
on the video. Sure, you know, sure. If I had a market board, <laughs> uh, but just for the sake, I'm using my hands. I feel like I'm it doing works. A little, it uh, works. It's all good. Yeah. For everybody listening to the audio <laughs> version, they have no idea that he's talking with his hands. <laughs> yeah, Use your you imagination. Yeah. Uh, but if you can envision this, typically what we do with leaders is that leaders don't go very far down the leadership pathway and they begin to emerge mm. up the pipeline. Mm-hmm. They come up the pipeline because they're talented, they're they're attractive, they're yeah. eloquent, they're, they've got good vision, they've got good leadership skills. Mm-hmm. And so instead of taking them down the pathway and, and helping them mature and grow and learn right. to multiply, they zip up the pipeline. And so what happens is we got people at the highest level of leadership. They don't, they've really never been discipled. Right. Yeah, these, right. these pastors have never been discipled. These these leaders, and and th- because they've never been discipled, they don't have a disciple making DNA. Mm. Therefore, they're not worried about multiplication. They're mm. worried about self promotion. And, I, and I, that sounds really harsh. I don't really mean that to be an accusatory statement. Sure. It's just, hey, I'm just I'm just doing my thing, and hopefully, if I do this well, I'll get bumped up to the yeah. next church. But I'm not really worried about multiplying my life because I'm not really moved down the path. Right. Does that yeah. make sense? That makes no, sense. absolutely. And the uh, the other ultra, so that would be like the first kind of leader. He's I call that an L one. He goes right up the pipeline, but he hasn't mm. moved down the pathway. Another kind of leader that may be in your church is somebody that they've gone down the the pathway. Mm-hmm. They're mature. They they're discipling people, but they've they've never moved up in le- in leadership mm. for whatever reason. Uh, sometimes guys do that because they're just so focused on their disciple making ministry. They don't want to give any time to the to the local church. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've known guys like that. They're like, "Hey, I'm I'm doing my own thing over here. You know, uh, don't bother me with leading a, in the in the church." Yeah. Uh, sometimes guys are that way because the pe- the leaders in the church are are suppressing them, right? Yeah, because they're like, "Sure, hey, if 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 they take my role, then what am I going to do?" Yeah. You know, so they don't right. have the multiplication mindset. But what we're arguing here is the optimal trajectory is for someone to move down the pathway of maturing, growing, and learning, being disciple, learning to disciple others. And as they move down the pathway, if they have gifting and calling, mm-hmm. then they begin to move up into leadership. Mm-hmm. And the sweet spot is right there yeah. mm-hmm. where they are both in levels of leadership according to their gifting, but they are also someone who has been discipled and is discipling others. Yeah. And that's the kind of, that's the secret sauce, man. If you can get mm. some of those on your leadership team in your church, then these are going to be leaders that continually multiply leaders underneath them, mm-hmm. multiply their ministries, and ultimately multiply the church. That is so good because yeah. I was, and to your point, and this is before I knew you were coming on, I I, I was posed this question by uh, a leader uh, last week, and he said he asked me this point blank. He said, "Dan, does the is the next senior pastor is he able to get saved and be discipled in your church mm. to take your job when you're done? Yeah, like do yep. you have a leadership structure mm. in place, pathway growth, disciple right. making, multiplication, leadership training enough mm-hmm. to where a dude who's not even mm. saved right now." can be in your church, mm. get saved, follow that path, and over right. the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, yeah. be your replacement. I was like, oh. I mean, it was such a, <laughs> that was a thick question, right? That was yeah. like, that causes a lot of introspection because yeah. it's like, man, I don't know. Because we maybe have you know the Y-axis and not the X or vice versa. Yeah. We've got this one, but not this one. That mm. is such a great, that's a great point, yeah. Craig. Yeah, and, and, and I tell you what, I, I think the next generation, you know, of churches uh, it, it are going to be churches that are really focused on that. They're yeah. focused on leading people down the pathway mm-hmm. and emerging leaders to always look for succession. All right, mm-hmm. I have to be thinking about who's the next pastor we're raising up, who are our next worship pastors. In fact, our worship pastor that had been here for about five years. He recently stepped down. Um, he felt called to go to a different ministry, and it, it was all good. I mean, we love each other, and yeah, right. and I, I was affirming. He had you know people around him affirming that. But what was cool is he had a guy yeah. under him that he was training mm-hmm. and developing. And when he stepped off, this next guy just stepped right on. The church just continued to move forward. It was praise God all the way. Mm-hmm. And I look back and thought, man, that's that's the way it should be yeah, all the time. Absolutely. You know? 
we, we're, we're too busy just posting on staffing.com you know, for the next, <laughs> yeah. the next job. Yeah. And, and we're not doing the hard work of raising up our own leaders. Yeah. And so, you know, I understand that there is some aspirational element to that, but, but we're giving our best at it in our church. I mean, our staff is learning to, I mean, April the 4th, they're, they're producing their pipeline and where are the gaps and what are they doing? Mm. And then we're, and we're looking really the back half of the book is, okay, how did Jesus do that? What did Jesus do at level one of leadership? Mm -hmm. What do you do at level two? What do you do at level three? And it was amazing to see the nuances and the different types of things that Jesus worked on Mm -hmm. at every level of leadership. And so that's how we need to go about developing leaders within the church, just the way Jesus did it. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, when you mention that question, it sounds yeah. so almost jarring. Yeah, for sure. Shocking. Absolutely. Um, but maybe that, that's a reminder of how poor of a job as we as American church have, have done with this yeah. over the last few years. Because, you know, Craig, you're right. Our, our minds do go to, I think, the average church or average uh, elder board goes, to, where are you going to find your next pastor? Well, we got to get the word out there. Yeah, got to get a search committee together. We yeah, we got to find out who's in the denomination. We got to put it on churchstaffing.com. We got to like there's this never ending pool of pastors, you know. Or yeah. or or we got it's the seminary, right? The seminaries yeah. are not producing enough pastors. Like like they're the ones that are just it's pushing their them responsibility. Out. Yeah, yeah the, the the responsibility becomes find them, don't raise them up. Yeah, we got to find them. Where are they at? Like they're hiding somewhere. <laughs> like, hey man, they're just hiding behind that rock. They're hiding in seminaries. No, they, yeah. they haven't been. They haven't been given the opportunities of, mm-hmm. of growth and leadership. So, and historically, of course, the churches were producing their own leaders, right? When yeah. You go back to the yeah. early church and, and, uh, in those early days, but we've kind of abdicated that to seminaries and yeah. I'm not anti-seminary. I mean, I sure. teach at, at a seminary, uh, and I'm thankful for the training I got in seminaries, mm-hmm. but, but when you divorce the training of leaders, from the local church, mm. you're you're going to produce leaders that are not very effective right. uh, in making disciples that multiply. And if that's our goal, then mm. we've got to go back to school and learn from Jesus on yeah. how to do that. Well, and, and that's a great point, too, because I have seen uh, so often within seminaries, uh, religious schools, what they're pumping out is um, idealism. <laughs> like... Mm-hmm. With no practical, right? There's no pragmatism that comes with what they're talking about. It's all idealism. This Mm. is how it should be. But then they get into the real world with real people. Mm -hmm. And it's messy. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. It's messy. (laughs) Yeah, man. And so it's it's a full contact sport. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. As as a a buddy of mine said, you know, it's not for sissies. Uh, It's definitely not for sissies. It's so funny. We were in a we were in a meeting the other day, and we have one of our young leaders at the table. There were about fifteen leaders in there, and he had failed to, you know, enter something in that Mm -hmm. we was supposed to, you know, some administrative thing. And one of our seasoned guys, you know, kind of gave him a little uh, a wake up call, Mm -hmm. and and I said afterwards, I said, yeah, he. He got body checked against the glass on that one. But, you know, <laughs> hey, you know, that's how you learn. You yeah, know, if you, you can't you do, do it with that, the people that you hey, love. Next time I'll remember. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's that on-the-job right. training, right? Like that's the you, – you go to school right. all you want, but it's that on-the-job on yeah, training. Absolutely. So how do you begin to change that culture – in your church, with your with your staff, with your elders, with your deacons, all of your leaders, and everybody in your church, how do you start making that mental shift from "let's go find someone who's ready" to "let's disciple and let's raise up leaders"? Well, I think I know. I know we don't have much time left in our in our podcast here, but um, I, I'll just give you a couple of quick thoughts. One mm-hmm. is. You've got to identify what is the spiritual growth pathway. Mm. You know what? How did Jesus do it? What does that look like in your church? And I think for us, it's taken us honestly several years to yeah. really continually yeah. refine it to say this is the way we see. And how do we track people down mm-hmm. that pathway? Uh, honestly, if you don't start there, you're you're not going to be maturing. You're going to be elevating people that are not mature. So mm. I would start there. Uh, secondly, then you've got to establish what is your pipeline? What are the levels of leadership? How does how does someone emerge through those levels of leadership? And um, 
And then how do these two work together? I yeah. think um, just doing the hard work of thinking this through, and that's really what the book is about, is to at least give you some uh, thoughts, you mm-hmm. know, to start the conversation. I don't know that the book will um, be the end all be all. I'm certainly sure. not going to say that, but at least it starts the conversation, get some thoughts going in your mind about, okay, I could see how I could develop these levels of leadership and when I can move people up and what do I need to develop them. Yeah. And I think there's some really practical stuff in there at every level of leadership that uh, is just born out of, you know, 20 plus years of, of ministry. So uh, I would start there. Um, and then, you know, a, as a pastor, you have to start looking for these emerging leaders and beginning to disciple them and and elevate them. Don't mm. don't put a lid on them just because yeah. they're young. Mm-hmm. You, you need to be looking for the younger leaders and coaching them up uh, instead of just kind of doing your thing and then hoping that they will mm. come around. I'll close with this one thought. I, I was talking, I won't tell you who it was, but a very prominent pastor in the country and one of his right hand men was at, was at our church and we were talking about multiplication and multi campuses and just just you know, kind of all that kind of thing and and I made the comment I said well when the senior leader steps down you know, what's going to happen to all this that you guys have built yeah. you know it's just it's just kind of a you know what are you going to what are you going to do then and I'll never forget, he looked at me and he said, you know what? We'll let the next guys figure that out. Mm. We're just going to stay on to the sunset. Wow. And I thought, you know, boy, that's very short-sighted, no right? Doubt. For all the work that you've mm-hmm. done, uh, that's very short-sighted. Mm-hmm. Shouldn't you be raising up leaders now mm-hmm. that will be able to stand on your shoulders and yes. take it further than mm-hmm. you could ever take it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what we want for our own children. Absolutely. Surely yeah. we want nothing less than for our for the church of Jesus. Mm. You know what? You said that 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 the book, you wanted it to spark, you know, thoughts and what well, you know, what do we do about this? And just to be honest with you, as you've been talking, it's been sparking some things in me. And I just want to just even show you something that the Lord's been talking to me about, but then just confirming through what you're talking about right now. And you just <laughs> is a perfect segue. I think in many of those situations, like you just talked about, and even you just uh, gave the example of your you know, worship pastor, he's got a guy behind him ready to go. Every time you have to get a new guy, mm. the whole vision changes. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. there's no, like you start over. Yeah. And so if you're raising up that leader mm-hmm. to carry the torch, to carry the baton, well, they're, they're starting at your finish line. Mm-hmm. So they've got, like you said, standing on the shoulders. It, it Like if we're, if we're t- looking at this as an eternal strategy, mm-hmm. like now we're going way further down the road instead yeah. of, well, we'll just let the next guy figure it out. Right. Well, listen, if we know this is the vision, I think it's probably why we have to keep rediscovering discipleship mm-hmm. because right. we didn't do it with the leadership in mind to raise it up yeah. in our own ch- you know, churches and context. Mm-hmm. So the next guy right. doesn't inherit the DNA. Mm-hmm. And so it doesn't end up carrying forward past yeah. one, maybe two generations. Right. And, and and at some point, at some point, it's not just about your church. No. Right. My right. Church. Absolutely. At some point, it's about the kingdom. Yeah. And and if we're being real, a lot of us are consumers of mm. <laughs> the kingdom goods. Yeah. And we're not we're not producing a lot and and giving back to the kingdom. Yeah. For the kingdom good. Right. Exactly. No, uh, Stephen, to your point. Uh, this is really the secret sauce for m- church multiplication. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're not aggregating leaders, then the church can never multiply. And without multiplication, there is no movement. Yeah. So it, it, we cannot have a movement that, yeah. that's producing church, healthy churches across our country mm-hmm. or around the world, for that matter, until we really do mm-hmm. the work at home mm-hmm. of how do we raise up and disciple and train up disciple making leaders that will multiply. Yeah. And I think that's really what Jesus wants. He wants multiplication. He wants us to mm-hmm. go forward and multiply. Mm-hmm. And uh but well, what are we multiplying? All right. Mm-hmm. If that's we're right. if we're not raising up leaders that yeah. know how to do that, then we're stunting our own growth. And so mm-hmm. um I, I think you know in in our particular denomination, I heard uh the stat that ninety five percent of churches uh, do will never plant another church, wow. and wow. I think that's because ninety five percent of pastors leading those churches 
do not have a disciple making mm-hmm. multiplying mindset. Mm-hmm. That's that's really the problem. And and we change that one leader at a time. Amen. Hey, uh, Craig, how can people get a hold of your book? Yeah, just go to disciplefirst.com, disciplefirst.com, spelled out, disciplefirst.com. And uh, you can just order the book, The Disciple Making Leader. And uh, would love, love for you guys to check that out. Awesome. Thank you, Craig, for joining us. Appreciate your time with us today. Hey, Yvette. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it so much. Blessings. Thanks, Craig. Thanks for tuning in to the Bonhoeffer Project podcast. If you like what you've heard and found it beneficial, then leave us a comment and be sure to share it with a friend. If you want more information about the Bonhoeffer Project and how we can help you formulate your own plan of making disciples, then check us out at thebonhoefferproject.com. And as we always say, make disciples and let Jesus build the church.